I want to encourage you tonight from the Word of God. I spoke to you this morning about prayer, and I want to continue with that. But this morning, this evening, I want to let you know how your prayers are very important to God and how every word that we have offered when we pray is recorded in heaven. God restored our prayers. We have a God who is a God of preservation. He loves to keep things. And no matter how long you've been praying or how short you have been praying, every word that has come out of your mouth, it is recorded in heaven. And that's why God answers prayers. You remember in the book of Malachi, when the scripture says God is going to open the window of heaven to pour down blessing upon you, what does he have in his soul house? God has a soul house that he keeps our prayers. And every word that we have offered before his throne has been kept. And I want to prove that to you from the Word of God tonight in the book of Acts chapter number 10. I love this passage. I love this man. He was the first Gentile convert. I'm not going to talk about his salvation. It's a good story to talk about it, but I think you are pretty much aware how he got saved. But I'm going to be talking about his prayer life and the things that caught God's attention. And, and the question is, why did he pray? And what was the need that he had that he has to pray? But Cornelius was considered as a man of prayer. And he was a man who was considered very religious. If you look at verse number two, it, it speaks about how he was a devout man, meaning that he was a man who was very religious. He was a man that was sincere. And I, I shared this message a couple of weeks back when I was at Berean's Baptist Church at a Wednesday meeting. And I felt that there was a need that I can also share with you tonight. A hundred years from now, all of us in this room are going to be dead and gone. I don't know who is the youngest here tonight. My little man right there, he's about six years old. So 100 years from now, he's going to be 106 years old. And brother, will you live 106 years old? What a blessing. But let us assume that 100 years from now, all of us in this room, we're not going to be here. We're going to be dead and gone. And the question is, what are we going to take with us when we leave this world? And the answer is nothing. There's a man who died in Nigeria, and he had a hammer that he drives. It's a beautiful vehicle that he had. And he told his wife and said, when I pass, I would prefer that you can bury me with my vehicle because I would like to use it to the next world. And so the wife said, that's good. So not too long he died. And so they have to do a special burial to dig a special trench that they will put him in and, and, and usher that uh, vehicle and he can sit behind the steering because he assumed that he can drive that in the next world. And that's how he was buried. But never knowing that that vehicle was going to go nowhere. It was going to remain right there in the ground. And he was going to be opening his eyes, either in hell, if he was not safe. But if you would stand with me for the moment to the honor of God's word. And I'm going to read three verses from the book of, four verses from the book of first, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Acts chapter number 10. And the, the scripture said here, there was a certain man in Caesarea, called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth, about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy arms are come up for a memorial before me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity we have to go through your word. Help us this night. And may you speak to our hearts, O Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You may have your seat. Now, if you look in these four verses, you realize that in verse number one, the scripture tells us who this man was. And when you speak about a person and you use a specific language like a certain man was called Kevin, that speaks about something unique about him. A certain man was called, uh, uh, um, who's your first president in this country? Uh, George Washington. He was a certain man. So there's something unique about George Washington that you want someone to know about him. So the scripture said there was a certain man. Now, the, the, the scripture did not say there was a man or there has been a man, but there, there was a certain man 
And the, the scripture referred to his name. His name was called Cornelius. And the word Cornelius means a horn. The meaning of his name means a horn. And he belonged to a group called the Italian band. And these were young recruits of soldiers that were in Caesarea, the major city in Rome at the time. And that these men were recruited. And he was called also a Satorian, meaning that he was a high-ranking officer among those recruits of soldiers that were in Caesarea. But Cornelia was a career soldier, but he was not a Jew. He was a Gentile, meaning that he was not of the seed of Abraham. He was not of the seed of Jacob. He was not the seed of Isaac. He was not of the land of the, the, the priesthood land, but he was a Gentile. And you know much about what the Gentiles are and who they are. But the scripture described him, verse number two. He was a devout man, meaning that he was very religious. He loved the Jewish God, yet he was not saved. As you read this story, you realize that he was the first Gentile who was converted. Peter preached to him, and he got saved. But he was a religious man, and he was always a man who sought the God of the Jews. The scripture tells us that he was not only devout, but he was a man who feared God, he did not fear God all by himself, but he feared God with his entire household. Now, this is a man who led about 100 men in his unit. But we also, by eyes of faith, I know there were people who also lived in his home. I know he had children. I know he had a wife. But he did not fear God just by himself. He feared God with his entire household. That's my prayer, that my children will fear God. I want to see my children growing up that they will live after me, that they will love the Lord, that they will give their heart to God and serve God willingly and serve him with a willing mind. I will tell the pastor this afternoon, we had time together, and I said you have a wonderful family, two girls and two boys. And the greater things that we have is because children are our heritage. When we leave this world, we're going to leave them behind. It is sudden like children will die before their parents. But it's always good that when parents go, they can leave behind their children. But you have to also equip your children spiritually that they will serve God when you leave this world. That's the greatest legacy you can ever remain in this world, your children. During the time when you die, they may ask a question, did he have children? Did she have children? And they might say, yes, she had children. Who are her children? Her son is in prison. That's not a good testimony. Her son is a drugs dealer. That's not a good testimony. Her son does not dress right. His son does not dress right. You know, it hurts me so much in this country when I see kids who are not wear belts any longer and they have their pants hanging but below their, 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 their uh, 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 butt right here and walking like this. Then the question is, why do they have pants in the stores? Why do they have belts in the stores? It also hurts me when I see men with braiding heads. I never grew up saw men braiding heads. If I have a scissor, I can pull it through that head and, and switch it over, out of your head. It also hurts me when I see people smoking because if God wanted you to smoke, he will put a sheen on your head. Then whenever you pass, the smoke can begin to retreat, retreat like that. You know, when I came to this country earlier, my wife and I were ushered in by the lady, and she was an usher. This was a black church in Tennessee. And she took us in, and we sat down, and after the service, we went out. And the next thing I saw, I, she lighted her cigarette, and she was smoking. And I told my wife, I said, she cannot be a Christian. Because if you are a Christian, then you cannot put smoke in your, in your mouth. If God wanted you to smoke, there's going to be a good sheena right here. And then as you walk, the smoke will begin to pour out. And the smoke, the nicotine will begin to smell. But he was a good man. He was a man who feared God with all his house. I also want you to consider that he was a man who gave. But he did not just give just what he had. Look at verse number two again. He gave much alms. In other words, he gave abundantly beyond his normal given. And Cornelia was a gift giver. The word arms there means gifts. So in other words, he was a gift giver. He gave much arms to the people. And look at me in verse number two again. And pray to God always. He was a man of prayer. And that's what we spoke about this morning. I love to pray. And I will encourage you to, to also make prayer to become part of your life. If you have a car that's falling on the highway and, and you cannot drive any longer, pray about it. If you have you lack of gasoline in your car, pray about it. If your head is hurting, pray about it. If you are broke, there's no money, pray about it. 
If you are sick and you have nowhere to turn, pray about it. If you have difficulties in your life and you cannot see the way forward, pray about it. God is a God who answers prayers. He is faithful because he begins nothing that he does not end. And that's the God we serve. I want to encourage you tonight to begin to pray because God answers prayers. He was a man who prayed. And the Bible says he did not pray just alone. He prayed with his family, but he also was a man who prayed always. The scripture said, pray without what? Ceasing. There's no specific place to pray. There's no specific location to pray. There's no specific mode of prayer. You can pray anywhere. And that's what I love. Because there's a God in heaven who answers prayers. So he began to pray. He was a man of prayer. Look with me to verse number three. And because of his prayer life and because of his life of giving, it cuts God's attention. In verse number three said, and he saw in the vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day. That would be about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. In our time today. In the Jewish time, it was about nine, uh, uh, nine, nine o'clock, I mean three o'clock. And in our, uh, nine, I'm sorry, nine, and in our time today will be about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. An angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, And here is the key. That prayer, I come up, I'm going to leave the arms. That prayers, I come up for a memorial. And here is the word I love very much, before God. When something is before you, what does it signify? You are looking at it. You can feel it. You can touch it. And so our prayers are before God in heaven. I don't know what you've been praying about. I don't know how long you've been praying. But I can assure you tonight that every word you have authored, it is before God. Colonial's prayer was before God. And that's why God sent the angel. God saw that there was a need to answer his prayer. When he met Peter, in verse number 30, if you look with verse number 30, he met Peter, and this is what he said. In verse number 30, in 31, And Cornelius said, Four days ago, I was fasting unto this hour, and at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. And thy arms are hard in remembrance, and look at that word again, in the sight of God. I want to encourage you tonight to let you know that your prayers are not in vain. Every word you have offered, those you've been praying for for years for their salvation, those needs you have in your life, they are all and right in the sight of God. God has our prayer. He keeps our prayer. He stores them very well. Think about a computer. It has a memory that stores millions of informations. Think about our God in heaven. Think also about how all of us here, when you believe and accept Jesus Christ as a Lord and personal Savior, your names are written in the life book of heaven. So God has a recording or a recorder of every believer. He knows about our names. Whenever you say Father, he knows exactly who you are, he knows where you're calling from, and he knows your need. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So before you could say something from within your guts to pass through and come to your mouth, God already knows the very intent that you want to pray for or pray about. He knows it all. And so he has our prayers. Our prayers are before him. And it is written right before our name. When you say, Father, you say, who is calling? That's Brother Bender. And then he begins to write my prayers. He recalls them. And our prayers become a memorial. Now, what is a memorial? In this country, you have what you call a memorial for a day. And that is a time set aside to remember your loved ones. And that's how God has our prayers. And he remembers our prayers. They are before him. If God did not see Cornelius' prayer, he wouldn't have sent an angel to Cornelius. Not only because of his salvation, but God saw that there was a man that had a heart. And he needed to see God's grace. 
And so God sent an angel to visit Cornelius. I don't know if God's going to send an angel to you tonight to remind you of your prayer, but I have come to let you know that your prayers are not going in vain. Your prayers are not forgotten. Whether you've been praying for years, don't never feel discouraged. Don't never feel downhearted. You have a God who answers prayers. He answers all prayers. He might say, wait. He might say, no. And he might say, here is it. And that's a unique thing we like about the instant answer to our prayers. But our God answers prayers. And as you come here in verse number 22 of the same chapter, there's a testimony also being given here about Cornelius' life. In verse number 22, and they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a just man, and one that feared God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warm from God by an order angel sent for the, for, I, I repeat that, was warm from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words from thee. So the man gave a testimony about Cornelius' life. He was a just man. He was a, he was a man who feared God. When I, when I look at the fear of God, what is God's fear? How much do you fear God? You know, when you, when you are driving and you see the police light is behind you, there's a fear. You have to pull over. Because if you don't, you're going to get a fat ticket. If you don't get a ticket, you're going to also have resistance of arrest. If you have a problem, then you're going to see a cuff on your hand. And the next thing, you're going to go to jail. Because they are voice of authority. So whenever you see that light, what comes to mind? you got to submit. And that's what you see when you don't submit, then you're going to get in trouble. Then you're going to have a problem. And so we fear the police officer. We fear our government. But the question is, how much do we fear God? Do we have God fear upon our lives? If we are saved and genuinely saved and know Jesus Christ, our Lord and personal Savior, do we know that this world is not our home? This is not home. I'm looking forward to going home one day. My, one, my mom went home to be with the Lord two years ago. I love heaven. It is a beautiful city. The builder and maker is God. God is still building heaven until now. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And when I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And he said, where I am, there he might be also. Heaven is a real place. I'm looking forward to heaven. The cities are built with pure gold. When you and I get to heaven, there'll be no need of pop holes. Because we are beautiful. I love your roads here. You know, I, 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 I get jealous of your streets here. I always drive when I'm sleeping on your, on your highways. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to be driving and sleeping. <laughs> but when we get to heaven, we're going to walk on the street of gold. And the city is pure gold. I'm looking forward to that. The fear of God has to be upon our lives. Because here is not home. There's coming a moment that we're going to go home. I love heaven because I will have no need of getting up at 12 a.m. in the morning to put off a generator. Because the whole of heaven is pure lights. God's glory fills the city. There are going to be no light bills in heaven. All of your light bills will be cut off. You're not going to be able no more light bills. There are going to be no mortgage in heaven. You're going to have free homes to live in it. Because God's going to offer you a building that you never built. There are going to be no insurance, health insurance in heaven. Because we're going to have a brand new body. And it's called a celestial body. It is unbrokeable. It can never be sick. God said you're going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. There are going to be no sicknesses in heaven. I love heaven because it's going to become a permanent city. And that's my permanent home. I'm not going to move anymore. You know how it is and you live in Tennessee and you're going to move over here in uh, New Mexico? It's not going to be like that in heaven. It is a permanent city. We're going to be there for the rest of our lives. I also love heaven because 
We're going to see God and see him just as he is. There's going to be a massive family reunion in heaven. I'm going to see my mother. I'm going to see my father. I'm going to see my loved ones. I'm going to meet you in heaven one day. If I don't meet you here, I'm going to meet you up there. We're going to embrace one another. There are going to be women and men from corners of the world, in different tribes, different nations, different color, different nationality. We're all going to be assembled before God's presence, giving him glory and honor. We have to fear God because he's a wonderful, loving, and caring God. And then there was a man who testimony brings a joy to my heart to realize that we have a God who is faithful. He hears our prayers. He keeps our prayers. Our prayers are restored in heaven. There's coming a moment that God will remember you. Thank you and God bless you. Amen.